Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Chase Rind, the President and Executive Director of the National Building Museum. Good morning. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you for this morning's program. For those of you here in the museum's Great Hall, as well as those of you uh, joining us via our live streaming webcast, welcome to the Intelligent Cities Forum, a project of the National Building Museum in partnership with Time, IBM, and supported by the Rockefeller Foundation. We are at the convergence of two major events in history. For the first time in human history, more than 50% of people on the planet are living in cities. This is a remarkable demographic shift that just might be part of the solution to creating a more sustainable world. People in cities have lower carbon footprints as they live in denser environments, use less energy, and take more public transit. Yet, growing cities are challenged by complex issues of environmental equity. Reliable energy, clean water, resilience to climate change, and an equitable distribution of resources. At the same time, we are awash in information and data. Many of us carry smartphones that track our every movement. We have terabytes of information on our water systems, our roadways, our energy use. How can we harness this data to make our metropolitan areas more efficient, equitable, and healthy? This is the goal of our Intelligent Cities project, to seek in innovative ways of gathering and representing data to reveal new insights about urban life for all of us. For the last six months, the museum has created original infographics appearing in time and on our website that visualize data about our built environment. We have mapped energy use over time, made a link between a region's economy and car ownership, tracked how parking lots impact our hydrological cycle, and explored how and where we communicate. Each of these visualizations has been paired with polling questions, asking people to share their perceptions of the built environment regarding the factors that shape where we choose to live, how we define rural and suburban landscapes, our willingness to drink treated wastewater, 65% said yes, by the way, and so forth. To date, we have received over 5,000 responses, exceeding our expectations. Both the infographics and polling can be found at nbm.org slash intelligent cities. And if you are using our Wi-Fi today, you'll note that is conveniently the landing page. For as long as we have lived in cities, we have reflected on their form, their feel, and their function. From the launch of the first hot air balloon to geospatial information software, we have developed technologies to see what we have done, what we are doing, and what we wish to do. Today, the scale and complexity of neighborhoods, towns, and cities is unprecedented and so are our tools for understanding them. Today's Intelligent Cities Forum, as well as a forthcoming publication to be launched this fall, and an exhibition slated to open in early 2013, all of these will explore these issues and inform the decisions we make today for a more sustainable tomorrow. Now looking at the experts we have invited to participate on the stage and in the audience, and knowing that hundreds more are joining us via our online webcast, it makes me think that we chose an appropriate tagline for this project. What makes a city intelligent? You do. We are deeply grateful to our partners, all of whom are here with us today. Intelligent cities would not have been possible without the partnership of time, the support of IBM, and the funding of the Rockefeller Foundation. They have been true collaborators and thought leaders that have strengthened the museum's work. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce the moderator and the panelists for our first session. 
As I read your name, may I ask the panelists to come up to the stage. Ann K. Altman is the General Manager of the Global Public Sector at IBM Corporation. Dr. Xavier de Souza Briggs is the Associate Director for General Government Programs, Office of Management and Budget at the White House. Susan Piedmont Palladino is a curator here at the National Building Museum. Judith Roden is president of the Rockefeller Foundation. And we have had one change to this first session. Nancy Sutley is unable to join us this morning. We are really fortunate to have Michelle Moore, Federal Environmental Executive on the President's Council on Environmental Quality, to join us in her stead. And finally, our moderator, this morning will be Richard Stengel, Managing Editor, Time. Welcome all. So I'm delighted to be here. Uh, with this great partnership and this important project in a city that many Americans don't think is the most intelligent city uh, in America. Um, and it, it's been a, uh, a great collaboration with uh, IBM and Rockefeller and the, and the museum. And uh, we want to talk in a general way about, about this theme. Everybody on the panel has his or her own specific interests, but I think we will unite it in a kind of symphony about what will make, what does make an intelligent city. Um, speaking of intelligence, why are people clustered like this? They should be all in the <laughs> front of the room. So um, you were introduced to everybody, and what we're going to do this morning is everybody will have a chance to talk a little bit about, um, kind of present uh, his or her thoughts on, on this idea, and then we'll talk together in about 45 minutes or so into the program, we'll take questions from the audience and questions from social media uh, and Twitter. So um, good morning again. So I'm going to start with you, Anne. Um, and I'd, I'd love it if you talked a little bit about, and your background is as an engineer, right? Um, that, well, I started many, many years okay. ago, three decades ago no, but as I'm assistant engineer. I'm impressed by that. So, I, uh, <laughs> so let's talk about what IBM is doing, what IBM is doing with, uh, to kind of foster intelligent cities around the country. Um, and, and again, thanks for this great partnership. Oh, thank you. I have to say, this is a, an incredible panel that's been assembled, and IBM is just delighted to be a part of the forum today. Uh, this whole idea around smarter cities is pretty profound, and we, we touched on the fact that most cities around the world have grown up over a long period of time, and yet here we are, oh, a little louder there, um, where today cities are growing at an extraordinary rate, right? A million people are moving into cities every week, populations are burgeoning, and yet the infrastructure that supports cities in most cases is quite aged. And as we all know that um, over you know, the last decade or so, the world has really, really changed, right? We have uh, instrumented everything we have cell phones, we have sensors on traffic lights, we have sensors in roadways, we have uh, sensors on sewer pipes. And so all of this has the potential of creating not just the data, but for us to be able to use that data to dramatically change the systems and improve the functionality of cities around the globe. And so that's what IBM was doing two years ago, back uh, almost 2008, so almost three years ago, was in introducing to the world this idea of smarter planets, smarter cities. And since then, we've had over 2,000 engagements with cities all over the globe, working with them to take this information, to streamline and process this in a way that improves transportation and water and energy and buildings. And so it's an extraordinary opportunity that we face now uh, globally to, and to create intelligent cities, and Washington is no exception. Great. Um, so Michelle, talk about um, how the White House is helping with this. And uh, in the case of President Obama, he in many ways wanted to be, and stated when he was running for president, that he wanted to be the sort of environmental 
president. Um, how, is, how is that manifesting itself in terms of this initiative? I think certainly when we talk about um, you know, the, the work of the, the White House Council you know, on Environmental Quality, that making you know, fact-based decisions, really depending on the science, uh, which the president is committed to as well, you know, and, and looking at how we really empower ourselves and empower solid decision-making with good information has been critical. And you see that not only in the origins of the White House Council on Environmental Quality 40 years ago in the National Environmental Policy Act, which is a, effectively a look-before-you-leap statute, uh, but also the way that science and good data is being used to enable decisions today. And um, I think you see that also across the whole scope of the federal agencies. When you look at the administration's commitment to not just collecting the right information and basing our own decisions on it, but also empowering stakeholders, empowering city leaders as well, you know, through transparency, uh, through the commitments that we've made to open government, uh, through making more and more the information that we collect as the federal government available openly on data.gov. You know, I think some of the key challenges that we face, you know, not just in terms of how we look at our relationship with cities around the country, you know, which really are often uh, um, on the vanguard of change when we look at some of the issues that are affecting us today, like um, uh, the impacts of climate change and adaptation that's been on you know, in the New York Times the past several weeks, uh, but, but really how we empower people with information in the moment in which they're making a decision, because as Chase observed in his opening remarks, when you're talking about you know, terabytes and you know, information on your cell phone that you've never really been equipped with before, how does that translate into making a different decision and a better decision in the moment that's going to help create more sustainable communities? Mm -hmm. Right, Judy. Um, Judy's president of the Rockefeller Foundation, and uh, we got to know each other when we were both in the original Intelligent City exactly. in America, Philadelphia, when Judy was president <laughs> of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, she's been a transformational leader of this of the Rockefeller Foundation. But Rockefeller's been interested in intelligent cities for a long time, haven't they? Uh, we have, and thank you, Rick. It's great to be here, and great to be here with this panel and and all of you. Um, our goal for the 21st century is actually to seek innovation. Um, to catalyze it, but also to seek out innovation uh, wherever it's occurring in the areas in which we're working. And we see tremendous, really tremendous need for and tremendous potential in innovation um, when it comes to technology with regard to cities. As Anne said, the planet is for the first time over 50% urban. And what's striking about that demographic is that it will be three quarters urban um, by about 2050. So we're seeing this almost tsunami of urbanization. Lots and lots of it is going to occur in the developing world where right now there is the opportunity for some really exciting green fields innovation because a lot of those cities are being built from the ground up uh, in China and in India and many other places in the world. So urbanization is basically a good thing. Um, it's an engine for economic growth. It's an engine for creativity. Um, it is also a place where poverty concentrates. And so getting those trends and really figuring out how to use um, intelligent uh, technology to develop the right infrastructure, to really build sustainability, and at the same time building inclusiveness. So when we at Rockefeller define intelligent, we mean what well, we mean technology intelligent, but we also mean resilient, sustainable, and inclusive. Um, because the critical question is intelligent to do what and intelligent for whom. And if we don't answer those questions successfully, we really aren't going to build the intelligent um, city of the 21st century. So those are the kind of issues that, that we really worry about. And, Intelligence here, um, in terms of sustainability, means building resilience. It really does give us the opportunity to predict uh, the kinds of shocks, whether they're climate-related shocks or financial shocks, that will occur and build resilience in advance. It allows us to use data and information in an innovative way to really more intentionally foster economic growth. And it also allows us to use data and technology more effectively to really build inclusiveness. And, and often, and, and we'll come back to that, I'm sure, um, the people who could benefit the most from some of these intelligent interventions are potentially excluded. So how you systematically reach in and provide for uh, the opportunity 
um, both for ground up initiatives uh, with regard to the use of technology, but also inclusiveness um, uh, for the people who need it, I think is one of the challenges of how this innovation really unfolds. Now, um, speaking of sustainability, Xavier, what, is the, what can the federal government do to, to help the sustainability of cities? And also, I'd love you to tell everybody, explain what your job is, because when I read about it, gave me a headache thinking about what you have to do in terms of interagency coordination. I, I was going to say, I, I still can't explain it to my mom, but <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a shot. Let me answer your question and sort of weave that in. You know, on one hand, the federal role has been, and I think will continue to be in a number of ways, foundational to the things that we're talking about. It can ensure the outcomes uh, that Dr. Roden or others on the panel referenced, but everything from looking back over the last 50 years, sort of laying the foundations of the, the internet, uh, wireless technology, the telemetry systems that enable GPS, all these ingredients now that we take for granted that are sort of part and parcel of the intelligence we want to create. That, in addition to making the digital space, there is a spectrum shortage in our country. Other nations are aware of it too. The president outlined last year the goal of freeing up and reallocating, proving the use of, about 500 megahertz over the next decade. And what it will take to do that is a day's conversation in and of itself, a piece of what I'm involved with, but it's an incredibly important thing to do. It's not something one company, one city, let alone one neighborhood can do. Spectrum, the wireless broadband spectrum all around us, is a national asset. So this is a, a role the federal government must play in consultation with uh, citizens and working with companies and federal agencies like Defense and NOAA and others that do very, very important things. But directly on your question, when it comes to contributing to sustainability, I think there are a number of things. I'll highlight just, just one for the moment. Um, healthy incentives is something I would, I would point to. You know, the federal government was here again instrumental and not always in the best ways in creating the urban form that we know now. Um, everything from the interstate highway system to inexpensive mortgages that help fuel the growth of, of the suburbs. There are many upsides to those things, obviously. But we've paid something of a cost, too, in terms of a form and a lifestyle and even an economy that has, in some ways, a, a lack of sustainability to it, as I think everyone here knows. So going the other direction, just one you know, instance that I would, I would highlight is in the administration's approach to surface transportation and what it may look like going forward, we have talked about bringing some of the genius of the race to the top approach from education, mm -hmm. where states compete for dollars to implement ambitious plans, but it is a contest to qualify. So to get the funds, or pardon me, to even qualify to compete for the funds, they enact reforms first. That's fairly revolutionary when it comes to federal grant making. One of the things we've talked about is applying that to infrastructure investments, major federal infrastructure investments. So as a metro, whether it's D.C. or Philadelphia or New York or anywhere else, Miami, you'd need to sort of say, we want to be able to hit the following uh, outcomes over the next 10, 15, 25 years. We see intelligence in the sense we're talking about this morning as woven into that. And in terms of what we want to achieve, the intelligence, quote unquote, is a means to an end, as everyone here is saying. So, this is about connecting workers to jobs throughout the regional labor market, regardless of their background, regardless of the neighborhood they come from, et cetera, et cetera. And you can think about a number of different dimensions, but it would be a fairly revolutionary way to spend dollars that traditionally have simply been devolved to states with relatively few specific outcome expectations and tons of paperwork, right? Tons of oversight. <laughs> Prove to us you're not breaking the law. Well, that's, that's important. Oversight matters but it doesn't necessarily achieve outcomes that you care about. Uh, talk a little, one minute on how you integrate the, the different um, agencies in the federal government. Sure, well. Which it, are unintegratable, I think. I hope you're wrong. Okay. The, the Office of Management and Budget, without going into too much detail, is a device for the president, for this and every other president, to coordinate and to integrate. Um, you think about different agencies, different programs, there is a quality of their sort of super tankers set on, in, on their own courses. They're overseen by different congressional committees. They have different work cultures and missions and so on. But there are an extraordinary number of areas from sustainable uh, development where we have HUD 
and transportation and EPA in partnership in ways that are fairly unprecedented. From the Spectrum Initiative, where we have the Commerce Department and NSF working with the FCC, an independent regulator, and the different agencies that use Spectrum, where our office and other parts of the White House can really uh, get folks together around a common set of goals and then figure out what are the barriers we have to knock down to achieve them. Uh, are there regulatory changes we need? Are there legislative changes we need? Are there critical types of resource? And being that central function for management and budget, uh, we're in a fairly unique position to do that. Some of it is a slog, quite frankly, through a lot of details. Um, but we think it's also an invaluable role, everything from creating standards for the collection of data on building energy consumption to thinking about sustainability 10, 20 years out. Uh, you know, it's about getting people together and talking through what it will take to get there and then sort of locking arms and moving on all fronts. Some of it really is administrative. As I say, some of it is working with Congress. Some of it is ensuring at a time of record deficits, obviously enormous fiscal challenges, that we have resources in the critical places to at least make sure we can make progress and not lose ground. Well, good luck with that. Um, Susan, so the, the museum, and you have been really out front on this issue and, and proactive in a way that's really admirable. So I'd love to you to talk about what the museum's activities are and endeavors and, and what you're hoping to achieve. Well, I think I'd start off by um, reminding everyone of our mission. The National Building Mu Museum's mission is really to celebrate all of the building arts and educate the public. And so to do that, we have the chance to sort of shine a bright light on various aspects of the built environment and the building arts. And while it might not seem obvious that that device in your pocket is one of the building arts, I think this topic of information and communications technology is actually joining the club of the building arts. And to sort of make that point, I guess, over the course of the history of building cities and buildings, different technologies have joined the club, right? You could say that the history of architecture, originally the only technology was masonry. And gradually, plumbing joined the club, environmental systems, all of these other technologies join the building arts because architects, designers, urban planners have to literally make room for them. But also, our use of the, those technologies changes building types, they change how we operate in the city. And so the newest members of the Building Arts Club is information and communications technology. And that really works two ways, I think. We've talked about how um, things can be instrumented, right? So buildings and bridges and infrastructure can talk to one another and can talk to engineers and governmental organizations and report their status. But one of the things certainly we're most interested in is how people talk to one another and also where are they when they're doing it? What kind of shape are we giving the city because of these new technologies? And because of who we are, the National Building Museum, we get the chance to look back on the history of technology in the city, of urban technologies and building technologies, and also to begin to look ahead a little bit at what's coming up. So we occupy this wonderful position of inviting people, like the people in this room, to begin to think about, well, how are these things gonna change the way we live in the city and how do they change our relationship to buildings? I was thinking when I was on my way in this morning that by the time I got here, I had actually experienced four centuries of urban technology, and that was before mm -hmm. I even had my first cup of coffee. <laughs> um, because in Washington, we experienced a city laid out um, based on mobility technologies, technologies of the 18th century, survey technologies, or technologies of representation, and that's the city of Washington. And then all of the familiar 19th century technologies, the subway, the elevator, um, the things we take for granted, uh, we're in a 19th century world right now. And then, of course, the 20th century, the cars that I dodged on my way to the metro, and checking my email on my way here. And so all of those technologies together are influencing the city. Um, I think finally, the question of sustainability has come up. And the Building Museum, uh, probably almost a decade ago, really committed itself to taking that topic on and helping to educate the public about what that really means, what 
each of our roles are, uh, each of our roles is in sort of addressing sustainability from our first exhibition, Big and Green, the greenhouse, green community. And I think Intelligent Cities is really, number one, deepening the meaning of sustainability for our visitors to include issues of environmental justice um, and equity and how policies influence those things, but also how better information actually helps us to understand how our cities and buildings are performing better. So let's, let's you brought up uh, history, and, and cities, of course, do have a long history. More and more people in the world are, are living in metro areas now than any time mm -hmm. in our history. Um, and I'd love to direct this first question to Anne and, and Judy. The, the, there was a time, and not too long ago, and I'm thinking of the 1950s and 60s, where people thought, yes, there's a lot of new data about cities, and men, like in my home city, Robert Moses, used, allegedly used data to create uh, parts of cities that actually were inimical to the interest of the residents. Um, that happened in Philadelphia as well. What's different now, apart from cell phones and, and GPS devices, that will make sure that we do something that is beneficial and organ organically helpful to cities than what happened in the 50s and 60s, where a lot of those endeavors actually helped destroy parts of cities? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I think. When you, when you think back to the 50s and 60s, much of the data that was collected was quite static. And so we were looking at uh, data almost historically to make decisions about how we would live our lives in the future. So for one, as we've talked about, data exists everywhere and the ability to capture that real time and to analyze that uh, real time and to predict um, uh, movement and, is, is quite different today. Let me give you one example. Uh, we have a project in IBM called City in Motion, and it really struck me as Susan was talking. You know, this project is all about uh, capturing information about how people live and move. How, so your cell phone, it, capturing those signals and, and knowing where people are in the city capturing information about cars and, and what they're emitting on how, what roads are traveled, capturing information um, from various sensors in the city that then overlays the city and says um, digitally that shows how people are moving, when they move, how they get to work, uh, where they're going for, for social outlet. And it's a, a very powerful tool for city organizers and for the people to see, aha, you know, here's how if we want to have green space, where we need to create that green space so people can get to it. Here's how we can change uh, roads, uh, manage our roads so that we don't sit in traffic jams, which most of us spend a year of our lives. <laughs> you know, uh, living in traffic jams. So it, it's a, a very powerful tool. So the point of data having, uh, today, having data accessible to us really changes the dynamic completely for how you can apply that and improve everything from transportation to uh, city planning. Um, let me start, Rick, then by saying what's not different and then what is different today. What's not different is that if you look through the course of history, measurement and data, the availability of new techniques for that precede really revolutionary change. So they have often been the precursors for the next round of innovations. I mean, think the microscope or the telescope or the mapping of the genome or all of those were in a way just measurement devices mm -hmm. that produced new kinds of data that allowed new kind of innovation. So I think it's absolutely crucial that we're at another inflection point uh, where that opportunity is so readily available to us again. What's different now is I don't think that the opportunity to abuse data will ever again be as readily available because date, there is so much greater access yeah. to data and so much greater ability to use data that is provided, whether intentionally, transparently, or unintentionally available, think WikiLeaks and other um, kinds of, of uh, uh, unintentional uses of uh, and access to data 
that really do perhaps prevent or at least mitigate against the, whether it's Robert Moses-like abuse or other kinds of abuses. So we're fun, we've been uh, helping to fund a project, Map Kibera, that was developed in the slums of Nairobi where the slum residents themselves were mapping um, the informal economy, mapping the residential pattern because they are gray areas on the map of Nairobi and because they were not mapped by the government, the government never had to provide services and there were all kinds of abuses going on. So here people were really coming um, to grips with the fact that they needed to generate the data. And you see that happening in slum dwellers organizations really increasingly around the world um, as a means of empowerment. Think of Yu Shahidi, another grantee of ours, who really are um, using Twitter and Facebook and Think Arab Spring. You know, all of the ways that people themselves from, from the ground up um, are using these technologies to empower themselves and prevent the kind of abuses that have most typically not always been identified with um, government abuse when governments choose to be abusive. So I think it's a mind-opening moment in a way that really is transformational. Well, speaking of government, let's, I'd like to direct this next question to um, our two representatives, um, Xavier and Michelle. You know, Judy was talking about the amount of data that's generated today. Eric Schmidt, the, uh, the former CEO of Google, said famously that from the dawn of civilization till 2003, civilization created 500 gigabytes of data and information, and we now do that every three days. Uh, a lot of that data is generated by the federal government, and a lot of it <laughs> is collected by the federal government. I mean, how does that affect the, you know, the sustainability of cities, the change, changes in cities, but also there's another issue for, for many citizens, which is the, the privacy of that data. Um, you, know, you can track somebody's movements on how they get to work um, without identifying who they are, but lots of people in the group mind think, well, I, I don't want to be tracked. I don't want to have my information used. So that's a delicate balancing act. So I'd love you to, to talk about, A, how you, how, how you can use the the data positively, and B, how you can protect people, or at least the, the, uh, the perception of people that their, their information is being used uh, without their consent. Mm -hmm. On one hand, um, data that the federal government collects is, as you say, it's, it's foundational to so many things, including things that people take for granted. Everything you have on weather.com or whatever weather app you might have on your smartphone originates with the National Weather Service. We, the taxpayers, fund that. It's way behind the scenes. It's largely invisible to us, except maybe when there's a huge storm event and then you see the, the Fed sort of saying what's going to happen. Um, but generally the face is that of a private sector application or another kind of organization. Go well beyond that and the myriad other kinds of data that federal dollars and federal leadership in setting standards and deciding how we're going to collect and deciding you know, what high quality data looks like. Not, by the way, bureaucrats sitting in a room, but organizations like NIST, the National Institutes of Standard and Technology, working historically with leaders in the private sector, with nonprofit organizations, with citizen leaders to figure out those standards, to do it in ways that allow for public comment, as we were just describing, um, is enormously important. But no matter the issue these days, whether it's ubiquitous GPS that makes us trackable, or can, um, we face these issues of, on one hand, privacy and the perception that it is being lost, number one. I think we also face the, the issue of information overload. Uh, it's implied in, the, in the, the data statistic that you called off. So the need to ensure everything from, number one, affordable access to wireless, so across the social spectrum it's widely available but also things like educational advances, um, advances in educational technology is a piece of that, but sort of in enhancing the digital literacy, if you will, enhancing the ability of citizens beginning early in the life course to navigate enormous volumes of data, to make sense of it, to make judgments about it uh, as all of this unfolds. On the privacy front, as you implied, it's, it's a big topic in and of itself. I think I would note, though, the distinction you drew 
between the perception and reality and thinking people can disagree as to where it lies is an enormously important one. And you saw that some months back in the, in the debate and the controversy and the media coverage over the airport body scanners. I thought it was fascinating. And one of my many agencies is Homeland Security. So I'm the guy way behind some of those decisions about uh, what we put into airports uh, and when. And what's interesting about this is that you know, the technology is moving more and more toward uh, avatars, toward representations of human beings that don't enable you to link uh, anything a monitor might see on screen, a screener, to an individual human being, but nevertheless sort of identify risks. That's an interesting uh, evolution to me. It's not like the avatar provides richer information somehow, and it's not for the screener's entertainment, but it's in part to address a concern about privacy, privacy of the body, I mean, a very intimate sort of uh, concern, and to use technology to, to help address it rather than to exacerbate the problem. Michelle, I assume that all that data helps measure environmental quality and help you set specific standards, right? That in a way that we haven't been able to do before. Well, I, I think that when, you know, when we talk about sustainability, you know, you're talking about optimizing systems of systems mm -hmm. and um, you know, having deeper, richer, finer, more connected information to do that is going to be essential. You know, even if you talk about um, you know, the sustainability in the city, and you know, speaking of history, by the way, it's very interesting that now we really accept cities as sustainable entities, as that's part of the environmental movement in this country, embrace not just what's been sort of a traditional nature rural-centric way of viewing that, um, but uh, take energy use in cities, for instance. You know, oftentimes in cities, it's actually the municipal water utility that's one of the biggest users of energy, if not the biggest. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in many cities, many cities in America, vast, vast quantities of water get wasted because of leaky pipes. You know, very, very simple things, simple things to measure that have cost associated with them. But being able to connect that rich data that's being connected, you know, into an actionable outcome that's going to help us to improve not just the, you know, the, the big picture things that we can change through, through standards or, or grand actions, uh, but also to empower the individual level. And uh, one thing I wanted to build on that, that Zav was talking about as well is when we, when we talk about information and the richness of data that's available and the myriad of, of government reports and data sets that get published, you know, it's, it's not just about the fact that we can collect that information. It's about the fact that you know, social media and the development of internet technologies really enable us to connect them in a more human way. Right. You know, that's much more like the way that we think as people than the very binary, you know, yes, no way that, you know, our spreadsheets think. And that's an extraordinary transformation as well. And I think that you see that in one of the ways that these, these information sets are being aggregated. You know, I mentioned the Open Government Initiative and, and data.gov before. I'm sure that sounds incredibly exciting to all of you. Um, but, but this is something that that's actually very cool about it, is it may be the federal government that's collecting information, but it may be some some brilliant student out there that's figuring out how to do something about it that's going to help change a mind or change a decision or create a better outcome. So by making information available openly and giving the community, the public, the tools that they need to create widgets or apps or mashups of that information that can actually create a richer picture of the communities in which we live, that's going to be one of the most powerful ways that we can get to more sustainable communities, not just in the big federal government decision making that's creating these foundations that Zav talked about, you know, but also in the way that we're interacting with our own communities and our own neighborhoods day to day. Well, uh, Susan, so that, there's been a lot of mention of individual communities and individuals. And yes, there's a lot more information available to, to governments and institutions, but there's a lot more information available to us as individuals which makes it incumbent upon us to do something with that. I mean, how, are there any endeavors that you're working on to get people to, to, in their own individual aspect, to act on some of this information when it comes to sustainability, energy, pollution? Well, I think um, certainly the Intelligent Cities project that we've been working on uh, for the last, well, since October, has been an attempt to begin to have a conversation with the public. Uh, we began with our, hopefully everyone has seen them, our series of infographics where we worked out from the home up to the country. And we did that because people tend to identify most closely. I think we all do. I'm talking about people in the third person like I'm not one. I mean, we all, <laughs> you know, we all are people. Uh, so we'll just use the first person plural. 
we tend to identify more strongly um, with what we do in our home, but like Michelle was saying, we have no idea how much water we use in the morning, right? I mean, and it would be useful for us as individuals to know that and for the city to know that. So many of these questions scale up and one of our roles, I think, in the uh, first six months of the Intelligent Cities project was to provoke curiosity about how we live, the decisions we made about where we live, and to get people to reflect a little bit on their values. Um, on the one hand, and this is no disrespect to the technology people in the audience, the technology is actually the easier part of this question. The human behavior part mm -hmm. is the really difficult part because we, we carry perceptions and biases and prejudices with us that show up in institutional senses like the map in Cabrera where, well, we just don't see certain parts of the city. And we all look at our cities with that kind of blindness. I mean, there are some major projects that reveal that to us in other cities. But if I think about what, what's the Washington I know, I have my own blindnesses about the city. So I think our role is to provoke curiosity and that, that curiosity will encourage people to become actively involved. If we're putting in the hands of all of these people, all of us, the technology to communicate with our governments better, to weigh in on planning processes, to um, phone in on the 311 when we see a problem, we also want to make sure that we're increasing our overall urban literacy, just invented a new form of literacy we can worry about. We've been talking about digital literacy, and, but I think urban literacy and visual literacy where we begin to understand what we see, those are some of the things I think that we're trying to tackle directly um, with the Intelligent Cities Project and with the museum. Can I, can I just point? add some yeah. examples of, so put some more texture on how people yeah. are already using this and information from government. So San Francisco, for example, now has a, an amazing project where all of the parking spaces are tagged, whether it's uh, on the streets or in the building parking. And with an app on your smartphone, you can then tell when it's available. And, and they are, mon are uh, regulating the pricing by uh, availability. So you can determine where to park by how expensive or inexpensive it is, as well as where parking is available. So it's preventing people riding around looking for parking spaces, which is a way of of wasting gas. A lot of about 150 uh, metropolitan transit companies are now providing data that give apps so that again, you know where all of the services are and when the buses and trains are coming so that people are saving time, but it's also occur encouraging the use of mass transit rather than driving, so building sustainability. Or there are now uh, uh, grantees of ours giving walkability scores that come in the ad for the house or the apartment. So you can choose the house or apartment you're renting or buying by how accessible it is by walking rather than by driving or how close it is to transit for the things that you need. All of those are really now people using yeah. these apps and using the technology to make s decisions about sustainability on their own that when you add them all together are going to really make a difference yeah. uh, in terms of those cities. May I add a couple sure. points on that as well? So because here in this country there are some very innovative uh, forward-leaning leaders, city leaders. Uh, Dubuque, Iowa, which is a relatively small city, is a uh, entire vision is around sustainability and in two areas that are quite interesting. One is how do you bring the community together in a way that they uh, change the culture. They adopt and take an active engagement in the conversation. So they have something called Dubuque2.org in which they share plans and they communicate and um, and evolve ideas. But they also put data in the power of the hands of the citizens. So for example, around water, uh, they took a pilot of about 150 households. And in that pilot, uh, they could uh, manage their, uh, they could observe and manage their consumption of uh, water through the use of, of uh, the information that they had available. And they've lowered their consumption by over 6%. Doesn't sound like a lot, 
but they, they expect this is 65 million gallons of water a year uh, for this small city that would be uh, redeemed, you know, recouped by just people managing it. Malta is a nation that likewise has now uh, put the power of energy consumption in the hands of their people, where they're tracking their use and they're, and based on how they manage the energy consumption at home, so this is a private choice, but they have the data and as a result, uh, it directly impacts their wallet. Um, it is that kind of thing that I think is going to make the difference of adoption um, for sustainability. It creates awareness and supports people to make the right decision for themselves. Right. So um, speaking of communication, we're going to open it up to questions, both to folks in the audience. So uh, if you have a question, you can go to the, one of the four different microphones and direct it toward uh, an individual or just in general. And we're also taking questions by uh, Twitter and which I'm looking at right now, <laughs> amazingly enough. And in fact, the one that struck me, and you guys have just been talking a little bit about it, but I'm curious to, to burrow down even further. One of them is, what are the most interesting new methods for collecting data that can specifically help buildings in terms of energy? Um, and I'd love to direct that to Michelle and Xavier. Are there things that, the, that, that we're doing now in terms of uh, energy use of buildings that we haven't been able to do before, and, and what can we then do about that? There's some, there's some really extraordinary new technologies and really new management tools that are emerging there as well. And it's something that we've been looking at in, in particular in terms of you know, how the federal government can help lead by example in this arena as well through helping to build market momentum and, and, and help to develop some, some standards um, so that we don't end up with the Tower of Babel you know, getting built as we're resolving some of these edge-oriented issues. I'm sure that we all experience this as individuals. You know, when you get your utility bill, you're backcasting and saying, you know, at best, maybe how you perform versus, uh, you know, last June or July, and you can't remember whether it was really hot then, too, and, you know, how do I control my air conditioning systems and my lighting so I'm really saving my utility bill? Well, the federal government has about half a million buildings around the country that we own or manage, and uh, we're the largest uh, single commercial office operator in the country with an annual utility bill that totals in the billions and billions of dollars. You know, so being able to equip ourselves with better information is a really key piece of this. And um, there, are, there are a couple of technologies and a couple of, of behavioral transformations that we've been pursuing as well. You know, some were enabled by the Recovery Act, uh, so that GSA is the, the nation's largest landlord, um, is uh, investing in some very smart technologies for improving the energy performance of our buildings, because in some cases we had old buildings that could uh, definitely be modernized and, and brought more into alignment with high performance looks like today. Uh, but we're also taking that same opportunity to install smart meters and really understand, in many cases for the first time, you know, what that performance looks like. So our building managers, our facility managers, you know, aren't just uh, having to respond to people who say, I'm too hot or I'm too cold. You know, they can really look at, okay, where should we be? You know, what kinds of challenges are we facing right now? And, and how can we, from a human perspective, combine the data and the information that we're getting in, in faster increments about the energy use, the water use of our buildings, with uh, how those buildings are being occupied and used? or um, relatively simple steps like retro commissioning, you know, going out and kicking the tires of the building and making sure that it's operating in the way that it was designed to. Uh, and you'd be absolutely stunned sometimes at the, uh, at the challenges that get uncovered by sensors, uh, by measuring uh, how we're utilizing the space, and, and really by going and checking out things like fans being installed uh, in the wrong direction, pulling air in instead of blowing air out that has enormous impacts on utility bills and uh, creates enormous amounts of waste. So in, in those areas, by combining you know, how we're leading by example, how we're working as a, as a federal institution with openness and transparency, you know, we can help to equip a, and, and move the market forward. And that's really a fundamental principle of um, the Better Buildings Initiative, uh, which the president announced this past February as well, which is aiming to help save the nation save American businesses really about $40 billion a year in utility bills uh, by helping to make our commercial buildings 20% more efficient by 2020. Xavier. Mm. Michelle said, well, I'll, I'll just add, uh, you know, the, the building sector, let's be honest, suffered a, a great setback 
in the financial crisis come economic crisis. There was a lot of overbuilding in hindsight. I think one of the challenges going forward is to make sure that we don't lose our, our pace of innovation, the adoption of innovation. The building industry is fascinating. It historically has been relatively slow to adopt new innovations. One reason is it's not as concentrated, let's say, as, uh, as automaking, where a handful of automakers make most of the product. In buildings, um, not just for commercial, but let's say residential, there are a lot of small companies that produce a lot of, of product. And it can take 15, 20, 25 years to see the widespread adoption. I think as a country, we can, as Michelle was outlining, we can't afford that, quite frankly. We want to see things like smart metering much more widely available um, in commercial and in other kinds of buildings uh, going forward. If I could just add to that. Yes, yeah, sure. Just, um, because I think a lot of times, and certainly those of us who are architects get excited about building all the brand new buildings, and people think, well, we'll build yeah. new. But it's, the real issue is that most of the buildings we have to deal with are already here. Right. Um, it's not in brand new construction or in brand new cities or greenfields developments in the US where these changes are going to be most impactful. It's getting people and municipalities and property managers to understand that the buildings they've got have to be understood. And that's where I think understanding the situation through figuring out exactly how buildings are performing, whether they're 100 years old, 50 years old, or 10 years old, mm -hmm. so that you can begin to define the problem to yeah. fix it. Could I add a quick word there with a, another friendly poke at, 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 the, at the arts, as you put them? I am uh, on leave from MIT, which does a lot of work on building technology and whatnot. A lot of it is very exciting and interesting, building metabolism, all sorts of shorthand that I've learned over the years. Um, but the fact of the matter is that it is the new stuff that tends to be most exciting yeah. to researchers and to students and practitioners for given reasons. It's understandable. But it, it is these legacy assets. We need to get more excited about our old stuff and the huge built heritage all around us and what we do about, about it. Um, or we're in trouble, frankly. I think the, the thing that's interesting about buildings is not unlike cities, buildings were built with systems, independent systems, so water separate from power, separate from whatever. And, and now uh, you can create with technology very simply at a low cost the central nervous system that then um, understands and manages and integrates all of that information so that you can indeed identify where the hot spots are in the building or identify where leaky faucets are costing you. It, it's, uh, it's very accessible today and I think that's the, the opportunity for us. It's uh, not as, as uh, sexy or as exciting as building something from a new, but we have the opportunity to transform and modernize in a fundamental way all of the buildings. So if folks have questions, oh great. Um, oh, you are, no, you're working here. You don't have a question. I have a question. Oh, you can, okay, great. <laughs> Ask it. Uh, we, we, you talked a lot about water consumption, infrastructure, um, energy building issues. Is there a priority? Is there you know, one thing that you would decide to focus on first? And is there a city in the US or beyond that, you, that would be a priority? Why don't you jump in? Well, um, our experience from working with thousands of cities is that there is no one starting place, which is why every city is unique. And currently, I mean, you can imagine here in the United States and around the world, the pressures on cities are so uh, dramatic, right? The, the, uh, the tax base is uh, at its lowest here, the challenges that are immense. People are looking to say, well, we'll just cut. And cutting cost, oftentimes long term, means that you're actually um, short uh, changing your entire city. So it's not about that. So what, what do you do? Well, if you cut the, the public safety workforce, let's say, in the near term, maybe you don't feel that. But in the longer term, you see crime rise and you see businesses exit. But today with technology, if that's your focus, you might in fact implement uh, a system that does predictive analytics around crime information in the city, which of course is something that uh, cities like New York have done exceptionally well. Uh, you can reduce your workforce and um, improve the safety of the city at the same time. New York has done this. Crime is down 35%. Um, Memphis has done this. Crime is down 40%. So, it is a starting point 
is the choice of the city and the citizens, whether it's safety or water or transportation. But then it is, how do I take advantage of the information and how do I impact that? And uh, I think uh, it is absolutely incumbent on cities to do that today or they're going to get left behind. But here, how do we, we use data and information to lessen the economic inequality in cities? I mean, we had for decades in New York and other cities in the Northeast, uh, high-rise buildings of, for, for low-income residents. And I think a lot of the information now suggests that actually to have a, a dispersal of, of income in a city is actually a good idea. It's not great to collect people of any kind of income in one particular part of a city. So how can, how can we use data to, to make cities more equitable? Um, actually, Judy and Susan. Why whether it's data to make the cities equitable or technology to make the cities equitable, I think is, is um, the critical challenge of the 21st century. But remember that we're looking at the explosion of the use of cell phones. Not the most sophisticated smartphone, but the most rudimentary cell phone is transforming opportunity around the world. Um, increasingly in cities. So the most um, widely used, the, the greatest user of mobile finance technology is Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, per person, greater penetration than the United States. Very, very simple kind of SMS technology being used. So I think we're seeing the technologies very accessible now for the first time, even to the poorest of the poor. I mentioned Matt Cabrera. Here's another example of slum dwellers actually using data, um, aggregating data in ways that are empowering themselves and giving themselves for the first time a real voice in their local governments. So uh, I think rather than the digital divide, which is real at the very high end of the technological equipment access opportunity, um, a lot of what we're seeing at the low end is that part which really will be transformational and is highly available and highly inclusive. And not all technology intervention is expensive. So in New York City, among the other things that Plan NYC is trying to do in terms of sustainability is just get all the buildings to paint their roofs white. white. So Chicago's already been a leader in that project. That will reduce energy consumption by 20%. Very cheap, low-tech intervention, but something that really came from a data-driven discovery. There's a lot of conversation about whether you can cool high-rise buildings more effectively, actually, than we currently can do, even by the most sophisticated technologies, by building urban farms along the outside of those buildings. And there's a lot of, of technology, really, that allows you to plant vertically um, in many cities. And what that does is cool the cities, cool the building extensively in the summertime and reduces over half of the air conditioning costs. So a lot of innovation around kind of low-tech technologies um, is accessible and coming uh, in ways that I think will broaden inclusiveness. Uh, Susan and then Anne. Okay. And to, to sort of take that question to the um, design and planning end of things um, and the question of information and how that affects things. I mean, you mentioned Robert Moses, and I was wanted to get back to that because he's become this shorthand for everything we've, always, we've done wrong, uh, which is pretty good. Um, and part of what was done wrong was in the problem definition. I mean, it's so easy to be certain. You know, planners and designers and policymakers, we've been certain so often that what we were about to do was absolutely correct. And slum clearance, freeways, any number of policies where the planning or design community basically said, we're going to do planning to you rather than do it with you. Um, and I think you had made the point earlier, Judith, that technology in everyone's hands makes it very hard for people to do that now, that we can't hide plans and information from the citizens. Um, but from the planning and design profession perspective, 
the success of solving a problem is highly dependent on how you frame the problem. And what we've done in the past often is solve the wrong problem perfectly. And what we'd like to make sure of now with collecting as much information as possible about a problem is to ask ourselves, first of all, are we asking the right question before we begin to solve it? And if there are one app that I think every designer, or planner, or policymaker should have on their phone, and this is a challenge to you, it's the are you sure about that app, uh. <laughs> which would sort of go off on your phone the minute you finished a meeting saying, OK. I think we fixed that. <laughs> then the app would go off and say, are you sure about that? And it would ask you to say, well, which community have you forgotten to talk to? Uh, which factors are you not seeing? Where have you not shined the light to investigate this question? And so technology operates at all those different scales. And the activity of design and planning goes on. And the technology isn't just in communicating, it's in actually setting the problem to solve. Yeah, I wanted to go back to the, the discussion a little bit on accessibility because, you know, around the globe there's a billion people who are illiterate. And we all think everybody's on the web, but it's a relatively small percent today. I think 17, 20 percent of the world's population has access to the web. But cell phone technology is truly transforming everything. About 50 percent of the world's population already has cell phones. And uh, there's a project that we've been working on that I think uh, it is, it's illustrative of, of what we've been talking about. It's called Spoken Web. But what this does is it, it allows for individuals who may be, in fact, illiterate to actually use their cell phone as a means for creating uh, access and commerce by setting up a site and creating the ability to connect with the world or even their local community through the phone to transact business. It's a powerful tool. And in fact, we've talked to uh, urban locations like Washington about what would spoken web mean on cell phones in areas of the city that don't have access, that are the forgotten parts of the city. I'd love to take another question from Twitter. And maybe it's the nature of the medium that's influencing the question. But there are a number of questions about uh, privacy. Uh, how can we balance technology and the public benefits of data gathering with concerns about privacy? And I'll, I'll put that to everybody, but, but one of the questions I would add on to that is, what are the, uh, the misconceptions that people have about the privacy of, of, of this data? And how can we rebut some of those misconceptions? I, I've now you know, put my finger on the scale of the question. I'm sorry about that. So, uh, either answer the first one or the second one or both together, Xavier. I, I was hoping you would turn to one of the non-feds first <laughs> on that question. I, I think that, you know, this is a tricky set of boundaries to say the least because at stake not only is, is privacy but access to profit opportunities to, to many sorts of things as these, as these industries go around us. And I think that one of the areas where I'm more hopeful is in the realm of transparency, and I guess I would frame it as disclosure rules. Um, one piece, it's not the be all and end all, but one piece of resolving this, I think it's gonna be continuous. We're not gonna resolve it at one point in time forever. Uh, these systems are gonna to continue to change around us. But one piece of empowerment, a word that's come up again and again and again, is simply being aware of how the data are, are used and being able to elect how you wish them to be used um, I think many of us are believers that the defaults matter. It matters whether the default is your data are usable and you find out after the fact or you are in effect um, pulled into sharing the data widely versus the default is that your, your data are not as widely accessible and you freely elect and maybe some benefit is granted to you. you know, if we can share your data, we can also um, push information toward you about things that may interest you. And that's a, a sort of deal. And I can think about whether I want the deal or not. But that basic thing that shows up in our daily lives uh, in things like privacy settings and checking and unchecking boxes and these sorts of things, it's founded on something much more profound that I think we're still figuring out and the norms are still growing up around us. And frankly, the, um, the legal structure is as well. And courts are catching up. So what are the disclosure requirements, uh, where in a process are people given 
the right to or the opportunity to elect what they prefer? And is that done in a way that's fairly transparent and fairly straightforward? By allusion to democracy generally, you know, it's nice to have uh, the referendum in theory to be able to vote as a citizen directly on policy. It's not so nice if when you go to the ballot box, there are 100 complex policy measures and you don't, you don't have a whole lot of help figuring them out. That's a limited power then. So we, we can't end up in that world either, I think, where technically you can elect, but again, you're just swamped with choices that are very difficult to make sense about. I think this is a very culture-specific phenomenon and working for a global foundation and really funding around the world, I am struck over and over again by how America and Americans are much more uh, driven by and concerned about privacy issues than even our Western European cousins are. Um, across the pond. So part of it is the way our legal structure has evolved, uh, among other things. But there are lessons to be learned by um, what is going on, the kinds of things that are going on in other parts of the world that feel a little more relaxed about privacy, and yet we're not seeing the invasion of their rights, um, the, the provision of personal data being used and abused to the extent that, that we fear here. The other distinction I would make, and I think it's a really important one, is the difference between open data and open architecture. Mm -hmm. So many of us who are uh, proposing openness as we're thinking about technological innovation are really proposing open architecture so that there's less boundary between what's privately held in terms of the technology itself and what can be used for the public good. And I think that boundary really needs to be worked out much more carefully as technological innovation occurs. The other piece of it is the data itself and how much should be private and, and how much should be public. That's in a way a, a, almost a completely different question and it's going to require a different set of debates, I think, Isn't around that. Isn't there a, it, it's, I don't know what they call it in sociology, an individuality bias where we think, and you hear, yes, uh, the NSA is monitoring our phone calls. They think, yes, they're listening to my phone call to my wife last night. Well, of course, they're not doing that. Um, but yet we, we, you know, in a kind of psychological way, think that we're being individually monitored. How do you, how do you counter that? I mean, you mentioned avatars earlier. There's also, you know, there's, they're, they're looking to see which cars are coming into Midtown Manhattan. They're not looking to see if your car specifically <laughs> is, is coming into Midtown. How, how do we discuss these issues with people? Michelle? You know, actually, I was looking back at you guys because, you know, the, well, you know, the, the, the federal, I mean, ZAV has really clearly articulated some of the federal government roles and, and clearly um, agencies like the Department of Homeland Security or the Department of Defense also have a role in creating technologies that help to keep information more secure. And, and more private and helping to propagate those, um, you know, in, in, in the same way that technology transfer happens in some other areas. But I think that, um, you know, for myself, not only as a member of the administration, but also as a member of society, you know, some of the ways in which um, privacy concerns and how data and, and aggregation connect with open architecture and open standards also relates to um, media and the way that innovation and um, and uh, business entrepreneurship is enabled in this environment and some of the work that IBM has is, is talked about in terms of smarter cities you know, definitely seems to have a commercialization component of that as well. I think it's a very interesting uh, boundary, a very interesting area of dialogue with the private sector as well as you know, how do these standards and how do these um, uh, requirements evolve so that you get the innovation and entrepreneurship you know, but not at the cost of personal liberty. Could I okay, just we're, just you know what, we're nearing the end, so I want to get these questioners who are here. Um, I wish you'd come up and okay, stood earlier. Were you, were you first? Okay, Thank you. start. Um, it's clear that we have data and much of the technology available to move towards sustainability, but yet sustainability is not mainstream. What can be done to complement our accessibility to real-time information in order to promote the behavioral change that's needed on both the individual level, the business level, the industry level, to move our, our cities and to move our planet towards a low-carbon environment? 
Susan? Well, I'll take that just from the perspective of an institution like ours. I think it really depends on education. It depends on educating the general public on what that means, what the issues are of sustainability, and also educating design and planning professionals and decision makers um, for people to really understand uh, that this is a good thing. Um, and I think that in the exhibitions that we've done here, Green Community and the Greenhouse and Big and Green, we try to show the public how much better the world looks when it's designed and built sustainably. And I think part of it is not um, scaring people into changing behavior, but to sort of reminding everybody that a sustainable world is actually a better world for all of us. I mean, just a sort of minor example, I think in the architecture community, um, the sense that a building can't really be considered beautiful unless it is also environmentally responsible right. is a tipping point I think that we've reached, right? We're not going to see a lot of architecture awards given to buildings that don't understand which way the sun's coming from. Mm -hmm. To me, that's an ugly building. And of course, our, our values, our sense of what's a beautiful city and what's a beautiful building, they change as our values about the built environment change. And so, because I'm on the education side of things, to me it has to actually begin there, where we, we value things differently. Uh, is it Alan? Yes. Okay, shoot. I'm uh, sorry, I could, could I add one note to that last? Sure. This, I think this is an important missing piece. We've talked a lot about inf information here today and the value of things like real-time feedback to users and customers, and that's vital. But the other thing is pricing. Let's be honest. It, it matters how things are priced. Uh, DC has priced plastic bags. San Francisco has priced garbage hauling, making people sensitive to what they throw away. And one of the things, if there is a silver lining in our fiscal crisis, let's say, I think one of the, the silver linings may be that it's sort of like drawing a curtain on all sorts of hidden subsidies that have been there for years and years and years that in many ways uh, perpetuate behavior that really is unsustainable and inefficient, in some cases inequitable as well. Everything from how we, we fund drinking water systems or repair them or do other sorts of things. So I think that's a piece of changing user behavior as well. Okay, Alan. Uh, thinking of the trillions of hours involved in Facebook and gaming, um, at least in the first world in the US, um, wondering how collecting data from the public has been, has been turned into a game or is being turned into an entertaining thing rather than just a dutiful thing. Anyone want to jump in? I couldn't really hear the question. I, I didn't hear you. Yeah, can you Oh, please? sorry. Um, basically, how can we collect data from the public, from Twitter, from Facebook, to find out what their concerns are, not just getting data out to them through social networking and media, but also collecting data from them in real time? Oh, I, I think there's yeah. tremendous monitoring going on um, in cities, uh, many of whom have two-way communication with their uh, citizens through Twitter, through Facebook, through conventional tele telephony um, as well. So I think very much um, everybody is viewing this as a really interactive uh, opportunity to really learn from and continue to iterate. Uh, we talk a lot about the ground up providing critical information as well as that which is being provided by government as truly being what this moment provides that is quite different from the moments that preceded it. Uh, and I, it is through those mechanisms and other tools as well. It, just to add on that, I mean, there, there are technologies today that actually do just that, real-time uh, streaming of information that is coming across all sources, open sources, so Twitter and other social media, that then can analyze those conversations and uh, highlight kind of the, the core messages or the priority messages there. And this is being used today by cities. Uh, clearly, political figures are quite interested in, in what that talk is about. But it's also how are people adopting? Are, are they accepting uh, the priorities? Uh, and it can be used, in a sense, like a, a jam session uh, with the world to address issues like security and privacy. Uh, as we just were talking I about. I think we've got a ways to go, though. Yeah, uh, I think we acknowledge that. For example, it's not as clear yet how these technologies support deliberation, 
where you and I exchange views and maybe convince each other and, and all of us learn as opposed to merely making our voices heard, sort of suggestion box style. I mean, it is evolving. But I think we've got a, a ways to go. And one of the, I think, roles of technology is to help us tame complexity, not do away with it so that people think that hard problems are simple, but decision support, you know, te technologies like visualization, other things that help us understand what the impacts of big decisions might be on our daily lives. I think that's important for getting beyond more of an entertainment sort of function Absolutely. into citizens being informed mm -hmm. and teaching us from that. Yes, sir. Hi, Scott Bernstein, Center for Neighborhood Technology. Um, in the presence of information about the true cost of location, including both the cost of the housing and the cost of the transportation to get to the, the housing, um, uh, citizens have voted by the millions to tax themselves locally to pay for better mass transit, better communities, better um, options, which I think uh, illustrates the power of the pricing point that you uh, just talked about. And it seems that um, uh, public policy and influencing it through economic and uh, political participation is just as important a use of this information as, as anything else. On the building side, you can't have a net zero building if the transportation energy cost exceeds the energy cost of the, of the building. So all of this information seems to suggest that public policy needs to be recalibrated in a way to disclose the potential economic benefits of choices. Uh, we've got a transportation reauthorization coming up. There's other policy choices that are going to need to get made. Do you see a way to connect these dots? I'll start with Zav in real time. Scott, I, I do. I'll, I'll, I'll say two words, and then I think Michelle uh, really should jump in and share some stuff that she's working on uh, together with OMB and agencies and the private sector. Valuation sort of a flip side, sort of a cousin to pricing. Valuation, as you said, is huge. Um, both how we value real estate, how we determine the locational value, and give consumers, you know, let's say the equivalent of the fuel efficiency rating that's on the car when you're there in the dealer's showroom, but ways to figure out both a, a building's value that include things like energy and water consumption, but also the value of the location to them, which has multiple dimensions depending on how you, you lead your life. Um, and right down to concrete things, uh, Michelle, I wonder if you can say a word about the work you're doing with the Appraisal Foundation, for example, on figuring out how to connect these points about retrofitting the huge built heritage we have to how this stuff is valued, because that matters a lot. So, you know, in, in a lot of the, the, the listening sessions and engagement that we've had, not just within the, the, the vast federal interagency community, uh, but also with the private sector, the, this question of how we, how we value things uh, comes up over and over again. If you're talking about energy efficiency, uh, for example, you've got not just the savings that go along with that, um, but uh, how is that really adding to the asset value of, of the building that you're talking about? And uh, you know, so one of the essential questions that we've been exploring, you know, talking with uh, the nonprofit organizations that steward these issues, is you know, what can we as a federal community do in terms of information and transparency uh, to re really equip the market to be able to answer those questions? Because as, as Zav said earlier, you know, one of the challenges that we have with the building industry is that although we're we're ubiquitous, I mean, buildings are essentially human habitat; they're everywhere. You're always in one, except when you're walking between them. Um, there's not it's there's extraordinary disaggregation, uh, absolutely extraordinary disaggregation, not only in terms of um, you know, information and information availability, how predictable is the value stream that's going to come out of a sustainability-oriented intervention or an energy-oriented intervention, uh, but then also how do you get that information out uh, to the army of people who work on a particular project or the extraordinarily disaggregated professional communities who help to make these things happen. You know, so these are some of the fundamental issues that we're working to be able to address as well. And public-private partnership, how can we use the federal government's role as data collector and disseminator, uh, private sector innovation, and these strong working relationships to help answer these questions? Uh, as the manager of the Chicago Better Buildings Initiative, and we've been one of the ones that have actually been able to ramp up quickly by focusing on rental housing, nonetheless, what people are focused on right now is actually gasoline prices. <laughs> so with all this focus on buildings, uh, we're no more ready this summer to help people uh, cope with high gas prices than we were at a similar point three years ago. And these prices have spiked eight weeks sooner with plenty of 
morning, and maybe if people understood that that extra car per household they have to own is costing them 10 to 20 percent of their disposable income, it would be easier to see how to make the connection. I just want to suggest that this is a matter that's been studied and worked on jointly for some years, and maybe there's something that could be done in real time to integrate uh, transportation, energy, housing costs together uh, as a near-term matter of policy. The President's been great in his weekly addresses at raising the issue of gas prices, and it's a good setup to say let's do something about it using all this IT in real time. Thank you. Okay, we only have a couple of more minutes left. Let's have one more question. Thank you. Sorry about that. That's all right. Thank you. I'm Jane Ward. I'm a Master's of Public Health student at GW, and I'm a, a former Air Force physician. I'm, involved, I'm here because I think that actually the built environment is going to have the biggest impact on public health of anything we do, and uh, the, the health care system uh, can't, can't touch the impact that the built environment will have. But I wanted to follow on the earlier question about sustainability not being mainstream. I've been an educator my whole career, and I very much think that education is the starting point for changing behavior. However, I went to a very interesting meeting about a month ago on uh, pharmacy use and uh, the uh, use of medication by patients. And an online pharmacy had uh, asked the Harris Poll to see why people were not getting generics and why they were not using online pharmacies as much as they could, and how does this impact compliance. And they found that actually 70 to 80 percent of the people getting medications would prefer an online pharmacy and would be very happy to have generics. They'd gotten the message, they'd gotten the education that this was just as good for them, it would save money and preserve their health. And yet, very few were doing this. And I think Avier brought up earlier, we need to make the default easier. I think a lot of people want to be uh, living a sustainable lifestyle, but the default is not easy enough. They've gotten the education, they know it saves costs, they know it's healthier for the environment and for them, but how do we change the default, either in the transportation sector, the utility system, and I'd appreciate your comments on that. Rick, can I comment? Um, it, it, it's very striking that we only focus on the individual behavior that needs to change. This is going to be a complex change that requires systems level integration and then human behavior change. I smile sometimes when I'm on my bus going home in New York because they always say, please leave through the middle doors and no one does. And one of the reasons <laughs> I've noticed no one does is you've got to push those doors incredibly hard to get out, whereas the front door opens automatically. So that's not going to be a change in human behavior. That's going to be a change in the bus design that will then enable the kind of human behavior that we think is better human behavior. So we're going to need to redesign our buses metaphorically in terms of making human behavior then do the right thing when it comes to these areas. Uh, of sustainability, of resilience, of, of transformation, whether that is in health uh, or in climate change, all those things are going to be necessary. And by the way, when you talk to mayors about what their greatest concern is with regard to climate change in their cities, in terms of the consequence for their citizens, it is public health. So again, thinking about these not as separate pillars, but as real integrated systems that are both cause and effect in terms of how they relate to one another is going to be what really will enable progress. Anyone else want to jump in? So I want to thank our highly intelligent panel on intelligent <laughs> cities. Nobody can use that joke for the rest of the day now, but it's a fantastic start of the day. Thanks so much.